It's one of the least hospitable places in the solar system, a world of such crushing pressures and soaring temperatures that no known life form could possibly survive there. The near twin of Earth, Venus, is remarkably similar to our world in terms of size, composition, and distance from the sun. Yet while our planet is a place of forests, oceans, and entertaining YouTube channels, Venus is a hellscape of acid clouds, burning air, and belching volcanoes. No YouTube channels in sight. Stand on the surface, and you'd be exposed to heat hot enough to melt lead and pressure equivalent to being under nearly a kilometer of water. But in one important way, it's possible that our world and Venus may have something in common. Both might be home to life. For decades now, scientists have puzzled over some anomalies in Venus's atmosphere. Anomalies that could be caused by unknown natural processes or potentially by the behavior of microorganisms. With NASA currently working on the Da Vinci mission to drop a probe into Venus's atmosphere, now seems to be a good time to ask what the craft might find there. To examine not just the awesome science gains that will come from this mission, but also what it might mean for mankind's place in the universe. Were a medieval monk to try and sketch out a convincing vision of hell, there's a decent chance it'd wind up describing something that sounds a whole lot like the surface of Venus. That's because everything we associate with eternal Christian damnation, the stench of sulfur, the scorching heat, the agonizing pain, exists in abundance on our sister planet. At least, in a modified form. Rather than the fires of hell, Venus has air that is not just hot, but sadistically hot, peaking at an unbelievable 471 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than the daytime surface of Mercury, hotter than any other planet. If you were magically transported there right now, your clothes, flesh, and hair would spontaneously burst into flame. Not that heat would be your only worry, though. Even as you were turning into the real-life equivalent of the Fantastic Four's Human Torch, the pressure would be doing to your body what the deep sea did to the Titan submarine, crushing it as surely as if you were nearly a kilometer underwater. Above your head, 72 kilometers of thick cloud would all but block out sunlight, casting everything in a sickly yellow glow. Acid rain powerful enough to eat away skin uh, would sweep through the skies. All this as your last breath in life brought nothing but the stench of rotten eggs, filling your lungs with sulfur. A Scientific American once wrote of this hellish world, no matter which part you visited, you would die a quick but agonizing death. For this reason, the world's space agencies have only rarely sent craft down to the surface of Venus. While Mars, over the years, has seen multiple landers and rovers trundle across its frozen plains, sometimes lasting over a decade, Venus seems to delight in turning anything that visits it into a molten lump of regret. Of the handful of probes to reach the Venusian surface, only one, the USSR's Venera 13, survived more than two hours. Since the 1980s Soviet missions, no space agency has been back. This may be one major reason why NASA has preferred to focus on Mars in recent decades. The agency's last Venus mission was the Magellan Orbiter, which ceased transmission in 1994. Following its demise, only the European Space Agency's Venus Express and JAXA's Akatsuki have visited Planet 2 for dedicated missions, and then only from orbit. All of which may raise a pertinent question. Why would anyone want to go back? Why waste hundreds of millions of dollars visiting a world with a grudge against guests? Well, one reason we already hyped up in our introduction. As we'll explore in detail in a little bit, there's reason to think that Venus may be home to really weird microbial life. Yeah, that's not the only reason NASA is sending the Da Vinci probe there, or even the main reason. No, that would be our cosmic siblings' role in helping us understand planetary habitability. The basic fact that you have to remember about Venus is that it is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. It's about the same size as Earth, orbits within what we'd consider the habitable band around our star where it's neither too cold nor too hot for liquid surface water and is made up mostly of the same elements of our home world. By right, there should be two pale blue dots in our solar system instead of one. The fact Venus isn't a warmer version of Earth is precisely what makes it so compelling. Solve the mystery of Planet 2's hellscape and you wouldn't just learn a whole lot about which exoplanets might be habitable. Oh no, you'd also potentially learn the future of our own world. If you jumped in a handy TARDIS and traveled back in time, some 3.5 billion years, the inner solar system would look completely different. For starters, Mars would be an ocean world, a place with seas and rivers just like Earth. But the bigger change might be where Venus is concerned. If one theory is right, then Mars wouldn't be the only extra water world in the early solar system. It could be that for a precious few hundred million years, three of the four terrestrial planets held surface water. Three habitable worlds in our inner solar system, dancing through 
the void of space together. Now, to be clear, it's not at all certain that Venus did once support oceans. Unlike Mars, where the traces of ancient rivers and deltas can still be read in the landscape, the history of Venus is significantly more mysterious. But if this theory is right, then the story of our sister planet is not one of an inhospitable realm, but one of tragedy. In this telling, our early sun brightened slowly, meaning Venus was able to cool down from the heat of its creation just like Earth did. That means water vapor was able to form into liquid on the surface, creating seas and rivers. Light gases trapped in the ground, like nitrogen and carbon dioxide, would have leaked out to slowly form an atmosphere. According to this tale, once it settled down, Venus may have been a habitable world, one which remained a brilliant blue for perhaps as many as 3 billion years. This number is extremely important. Right now, NASA is spending colossal sums exploring the ancient lake beds of Mars to see if the red planet's rushing waters were once home to life. Yet, Mars was only a water world for 500 million years or so. With surface water for about six times longer, Venus would have had far more chance to evolve life, perhaps in the form of microorganisms, perhaps something more complex. If anything did appear in those bygone Venusian oceans, though, it was never destined to last. The ocean world theory of Venus assumes that maybe a billion years ago, multiple supervolcanoes erupted over a short period of time, releasing so much muck into the atmosphere that it created a runaway greenhouse effect. As the temperatures soared, the oceans evaporated. The atmosphere became so thick and heavy that it no longer protected the world, but it trapped the heat within it, warming the planet to death. At some point, Venus's tectonic plates, always smaller and more limited than Earth's, stopped moving. A great carbon trap was removed, and the planet's fate was sealed. That's one theory as to Venus's current state, and it's far from the only one. Others suggest Planet 2 was just too close to the Sun for water vapor to ever condense, meaning oceans never formed and the world didn't stand a chance. The important point is, though, that we simply don't know. It could be that our closest neighbor has always been a miserable dead place, or it could be that it was once a rival to Earth. Answering that is a key reason the Da Vinci mission exists. While no one's expecting the probe to land slap bang on a fossilized skeleton of some ancient Venusian whale, it should be able to examine the composition of the atmosphere to determine whether the water vapor contained there is the remnants of a long vanished ocean. If it is, then it will open up an important new chapter for us in understanding how planets live and die. Findings we might even be able to apply to the far future of our own world. But let's be honest, awesome as all this science might be, you clicked on this video hoping not just to hear about alien microbes that may have once lived on Venus long ago, but also about the ones that might, just might, still be living there today. It's time to take a wild ride into the clouds of this nightmare planet in search of what may be the most extreme organisms in the universe. The idea that Venus might be inhabited is far from a new concept. Even into the 1960s, scientists thought the thick atmosphere could mean Venus was a lush, humid world, a rainforest planet where the heavy air was crossed by lumbering insects. So, when astrobiologists today talk about the faint possibility of Venusian life forms, they're hardly breaking new ground. The only difference between today's predictions and those made in the 1960s, 1960s is that the creatures dreamt up today are far, far weirder. The main thing all serious astrobiologists agree on is that if there is indeed life on Venus, it will have to live in a very narrow habitat. High up in Planet 2's atmosphere, you get a band where the temperature and pressure drop to what we'd consider livable here on Earth. While the acid clouds and high winds do remain a problem, there is water up here in the form of droplets and energy in the form of sunlight. Interestingly, the Magellan probe also recorded plenty of oddities in this narrow band of atmosphere. Oddities some think might be caused by microscopic organisms. Take the strange shadows scientists have photographed in the cloud tops. Dark patches that can't be explained, they show areas of strong absorption. So strong that it's estimated they're drinking in the equivalent of half the ultraviolet energy that's reaching the planet. Planetary scientist Sanjay LeMay showed in 2018 how these patches absorb light on the same wavelength as some bacteria here on Earth, leading to the suggestion that the dark shadows may be the Venusian equivalent of giant algae blooms. Others, though, prefer not to look for visible signs of microbes, but for chemical traces, elements detected in Venus's skies that could potentially have come from biological processes. Infamously, this includes phosphine. Now, if you have even a passing interest in astrobiology, you probably remember the moment in 2020 when it was announced that a team from Cardiff University in Wales had detected phosphine on our sister planet. This was exciting because phosphine on Earth is produced by microorganisms in low oxygen environments. There is no known non-biological process that could dump huge amounts of it into a planet's atmosphere. Over three years later, that initial phosphine detection is unbelievably controversial. Many others have hunted for the molecule on Venus and found nothing, and plenty suspect the 2020 announcement was the 
the result of misidentification. On the other hand, the same team announced in 2023 that they'd again found phosphine on Venus. So, while well, the case is far from settled. Importantly though, even if it turns out there's no phosphine within 38 million kilometers of Venus, that doesn't mean there are no bacteria. Aside from the phosphine puzzle, there are other odd traces in the Venusian atmosphere. The presence of ammonia, for one thing, or the mysterious existence of small amounts of oxygen. Droplets of sulfuric acid in the clouds also seem to contain an unknown compound that's altering their refractive index. Speaking to Astronomy Magazine, MIT planetary scientist Sarah Seeger suggested that all these anomalies could easily be accounted for if we just imagine, quote, some kind of life form is making ammonia gas as some microbes do on Earth. This single possibility would produce a cascade effect that solves all these other problems. So that's it then, right? Time to throw our hands in the air and loudly declare it's life, Jim, but not as we know it, and then kick back and wait for Da Vinci to beam back funky pictures of Venusian cloud algae. But of course, nothing in astrobiology is ever so simple. While the case for microbial life in Venus's clouds may be intriguing, it also runs slap bang into a set of problems. The biggest of all being, well, how the hell does it survive up there? When we say Venus has acid rain, we don't mean in the sense of droplets that slowly eat away at old statues and cause trees to die over long periods of repeat exposure. We mean rain that is so acidic it would eat the flesh from your body. Great clouds of corrosive droplets that would do to even the hardiest extremophiles what a shoal of piranhas does to a drunk guy who fell asleep while tubing the Amazon River. All measurements taken of the acid levels in Venus's atmosphere suggest it is way way too high for any known life form to survive. Now, these measurements aren't perfect. It's been a long time since any probe sampled the planet's atmosphere, and it's possible there are clouds up there with acid levels that would only kill 99.9% .9 of all life forms rather than 100. But there's no getting around the fact that anyone arguing for life on Planet 2 first has to explain how it could possibly survive these conditions. Nor is it the only major problem. Pretty much all sensible proposals for Venusian life envisage extremely hardy microbes that manage to survive by floating inside droplets in the dense acidic air. The trouble is, these alien extremophiles would require water to live, at least by our current understanding of biology. And that's an issue, because Venus's skies hold very little water vapor. That's not to say there's none at all. It exists, it's persistent, and it's widely spread. But it's at low levels, and it's not very concentrated, which means it's hard to see how any creature could be sure of finding enough to live on. Still, some continue to argue that living creatures are exactly what we should expect to find. Speaking to reporters for the news website of University of Wisconsin-Madison, his employer, planetary scientist Sanjay LeMay said in 2022 that Venus has a potential to harbor conditions for iron and sulfur-centered metabolism. Together, our lines of reason suggests that particles in Venus's lower clouds contain sufficient mass balance to support microorganisms, water, and solutes, and potentially sufficient biomass to be detected by optical methods. This is where the Da Vinci probe will really come into its own. Now, we've repeatedly referenced the upcoming probe across this video without really properly introducing it. It's like a rude host at a party, forever keeping a highly anticipated guest waiting in the hallway. So let's at last make the formal introductions, shall we? Standing for Deep Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Noble Gases, Chemistry and Imaging, Da Vinci was the 15th project to be selected for NASA's Discovery Program, a long-running class of cheaper projects that try to make big science gains on small budgets. Selected in 2021 alongside another Venus probe, the Veritas mission to map Planet 2 in minute detail, Da Vinci joined an exclusive NASA club of hallowed craft. In the past, it was Discovery that sent the Dawn probe to underrated dwarf planet Ceres, Discovery that funded the Psych probe now on its way to a distant metal asteroid. Back in the 1990s, it was also Discovery that placed the first ever successful rover on Mars. Da Vinci, though, may well beat them all. Intended to launch in 2029, it will spend over a year orbiting Venus and taking readings. But it's what will come in 2031 that makes the mission so fascinating. At some point that year, the main craft will release a one-meter-wide spherical probe made of titanium. Designed to withstand Venus's extreme environments, the probe will carry five scientific instruments down through the atmosphere and into the clouds. Now, Before you get your hopes up, none of those instruments is designed to directly detect life. What they should be able to do, though, are tease out the secrets of Venus's atmosphere. This will include confirming the presence, or otherwise, of phosphine. Confirm, too, the chemistry behind the strange dark patches in the clouds. Maybe even suggest whether the process behind them is biological or not. As the probe descends over the course of an hour, an onboard camera will film these patches, too, studying how they move, gathering insights into their nature, perhaps settling the debate around them once and for all. Pretty cool stuff. Yet, as we said back in Chapter 1, it's not just hunting for life that makes Da Vinci so interesting, so worthy 
of an entire video on this channel. In its short journey down to Planet 2's surface, the probe should discover some truly amazing things. The lifespan of the probe Da Vinci drops into Venus's atmosphere will be short but spectacular, like the life of a mayfly born at ground zero for a 4th of July firework display. 175 kilometers above the planet's blasted surface, the probe will, in NASA's phrasing, begin to interact with Venus's upper atmosphere. But interaction here is basically NASA speak for fall through. Still surrounded by a heat shield, the scientific instruments will be incapable of taking readings. Oh, it'll only be at around the halfway point when the parachute jettisons that the fun really begins. With the atmosphere so thick and soupy, the craft's descent will slow to the most leisurely of crawls, even with the parachute gone. NASA describes it as the craft settling like a stone in water. 67 kilometers above the surface, the heat shield will finally pop off. At this point, the probe will begin to science the shit out of Venus. Like a foolhardy living creature, the probe will deeply inhale the air around it, taking measurements of the chemistry and makeup of our cosmic sibling skies. One of the major things it'll be trying to detect is the noble gases. These are ancient markers that should tell us a huge amount about the planet's history, from formation to its experience with volcanism. But all of this is really a sideshow next to attempts to detect the most important thing of all, water. Specifically, the probe will be hunting for signs of deuterium, or heavy water. Because hydrogen is lighter than deuterium, molecules left over from a planet-wide ocean that evaporated a billion years ago would have mostly escaped into space. Heavy water, though, would linger in the atmosphere. By finding and analyzing it, we could determine if Venus really was a water world long ago. On and on the discoveries will grow, mounting up as the probe descends, finally revealing some of Venus's most intimate secrets. For instance, there's the lowermost atmosphere, where the heat and the pressure reach such extremes that the carbon dioxide there acts more like a liquid than a gas. Known as supercritical carbon dioxide, it's something we don't understand very well, so having a chance to test a whole lower atmosphere made of the stuff should give us some remarkable insights into how Venus functions. But fear not, all you non-scientists out there, it won't just be data from various instruments that the craft is beaming back, but also the sort of high-resolution pictures designed to blow your mind when you're a little bit high. The probe's ultimate target is Alpha Regio, a raised highland region of crumpled mountains and ridges some 1.6 kilometers high. Previously, all probes that returned images had landed on the Venusian plains. Da Vinci will instead head for the high grounds, giving us our first detailed, close-up look of mountain ranges on this world. Ranges that may constitute the oldest Venusian surface. At last, after an hour of descent, the probe will hit the grounds at around 43 kilometers per hour. While NASA's mission doesn't call for the craft to survive touchdown, there's hope that it may continue to function once it reaches the surface. Not for long, though, the most optimistic projections suggest that it'll be destroyed by the heat and pressure within 17 minutes. But that could be long enough to beam back some last observations, to give us our first ground-level look at Venus in 40 years. At that point, Mission Control will be able to breathe a sigh of relief. After decades away, humanity will have at last returned to say hello to our cosmic sibling. Of course, all of this is still a really long way away, a future that won't arrive for the better part of a decade, a decade in which anything might happen to delay or derail it. To see what we mean, look no further than the fate of the Veritas probe that was meant to complement Da Vinci's Venus exploration. An orbiter, Veritas was selected alongside Da Vinci as the 16th Discovery mission. Intended to reach Venus first, it would have spent years mapping the surface in resolutions much higher than the Magellan probe, eventually using that data to help the Da Vinci team pick an appropriate landing site. In March of 2023, though, NASA announced that the project had been delayed for at least three years. Funding for 2024 was cut from nearly $200 million to a mere $1.5 million. A cut so deep, nobody really thinks that the project is going to survive. Normally, when NASA puts a project on hold, it offers bridge funding to keep the team and expertise in place for an affordable restart in the future. With Veritas, though, the engineering team has now been disbanded. Most likely, the probe is dead. And that has all sorts of chilling implications for any unlaunched NASA projects. What happened to Veritas is almost unheard of for a greenlit project that's coming in on time and to budget. If it can happen to one Venus probe, who's to say that it can't happen to another? Now we need to stress that there's no sign at the moment that NASA is preparing to cancel Da Vinci. Don't worry, we're not trying to make you panic. What we are trying to do, though, is make you appreciate just how fragile these things can be. How we can all be preparing ourselves for a mission that will propel planetary science forward by decades, only to suddenly see it all evaporate before our eyes. Assuming Da Vinci does go ahead, then it will be a truly precious thing. A probe that survived an era of cuts to explore our sister planet as never before. Whether or not it ultimately finds life in Venus's cloud tops, the fact it flies at all should be something we all feel grateful for.